Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center City Council Update. I'm Joe Lynch. As always, my guest is City Council President and uh, we understand President-elect for next year's City Council, Matt McLaughlin. Matt also represents Ward 1 in the City of Somerville. Matthew McLaughlin, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Joe? Terrific. Terrific. Matt, we're, we're, the countdown has begun. This is the um, next to last of our regular council updates for 2020. I want you to take it away if you can with some COVID updates and then we'll move into discussion. Well, yes, uh, so most of the updates I have today come from the state end. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people are aware that Charlie Baker has uh, brought us back. I forget the, what, which phase we're back to now, uh, but we, uh, he's rolled back some of the openings around gyms and uh, different activities such as that. Uh, the one thing that is surprising to some people is that he hasn't uh, decided to close restaurants or indoor dining. And I just want to bring this up to people because I know that uh, Mayor Kurt Attorney had a column with many other city managers and mayors around the uh, area requesting that we take a harder stance on uh, rolling back reopenings. And for me personally, I have, even though I'm allowed to dine indoors, I have not dined indoors myself. I have enjoyed outdoor dining several times, even in the cold. Um, and for me personally, I would advise against dining indoors. I encourage people to get takeout and to support local businesses that way. But the studies and the science shows that COVID lasts longer indoors. It's going to last longer in cold weather, in dry weather. Uh, so just because you're six foot distance from somebody in a restaurant, uh, that may not be enough. So I, I would, I just want to put that out there because I think you know, there, there's a debate about whether to uh, open rest to close indoor dining or not, but people can also make the individual decision to not dine indoors. And again, please continue to support your local businesses uh, through other means. But on a personal level, I would advise against that, I advise against dining indoors. So Matt, we have, um... In the city of Somerville, we are seeing our cases increase since last week. Uh, no new deaths, but we're still standing at 48 people have succumbed to the, to the virus. Statewide, what we are seeing is a huge jump in the number of confirmed cases. The number of deaths continue to rise. Nationwide, it is just a pandemic that is spreading out of control. As a result of that, what we saw Governor Baker do uh, yesterday was to impose some uh, early days pandemic restrictions. And what he's done, you're, you're talking about the restaurant industry, uh, but it affects a much wider swath than just the restaurant industry. He's now dropped the number of people who can gather in a public place back down to the, you know, the initial surge in March, April. Um, he's put more restrictions on the restaurant tours. He has basically said, uh, you know, no more this 50 or 60% capacity. He's dropped it back down to, I believe, 40% capacity for places like museums. Um, but he has taken some steps in, in terms of uh, gyms that now have to be closed. Um, recreational facilities have to be closed. That is in direct response to some will say he's been too slow to do this. Others are saying he's not done enough. But you have the flip side of what he did, which is the business owner saying, you're crushing us. There is absolutely no financial relief for us any, of any significant financial relief. Now, I know that cannot all come from the municipal level. Neither can it come from the state level. So it, I just want to give a little bit of a perspective from my part. Are we, are we saying to the small business owners, you're going to have to suck this up until federal relief comes in January or February? I mean, it, I, I'm not trying to be confrontational. What I'm trying no. to get my a handle on is we have a pandemic. I totally understand it. I think it's out of control 
at this point. And in order to get it back under some semblance of control, we have to take drastic measures. And you stated at the beginning of the conversation that there are some folks who think we are not going far enough. Um, yeah. So, so I guess I wanna just continue that conversation a little bit about, is this a case of where certain businesses are gonna be sacrificed for the greater good? I mean, I definitely think it's a case where people are gonna to continue to suffer all around. Um, and that's the unfortunate reality of being in a pandemic. Uh, so that there's not a situation where we get out of this completely unscathed. And we've already had so many deaths, so many closures, so much money lost na nationwide, worldwide. Um, so it, it is a concern. And I do wanna say that, you know, I have a great amount of sympathy for the governor and the mayor and a lot of people who have to make these tough decisions because you know you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't sometimes like if they decide to just ignore this for the sake of business then people die and if they decide to take it seriously then people lose money so it's very difficult um but i would say one of the th concerns i have with the governor's response and this is what i'm hearing from you know different leaders in the community uh different mayors and managers is that he's kind of putting it on the cities that if you want to if you want to roll back reopenings then you should do that but one i feel like that's passing the buck because the national government's telling us leave it up to the states and then the states are telling us leave it up to the cities you can't deal with a pandemic on a municipal level like that uh, it has to be a much wider response and then two is um what was my second the the second point is um if we decide to roll back on our own, if some of our rolls back and the governor doesn't approve that, is the state going to help us with funding to uh, to bail these businesses out? So we do need the state government. We really need the federal government to do something. Uh, but we could also use some help from the state government. And just to answer your question before about, you know, are, we, are these businesses going to be sacrificed? You know, it's... Um, it's a very difficult situation because we're, we are telling people that we're rolling back uh, these restrictions with no guarantee of having any assistance at all. And that's an unfortunate reality. Matt, <clears throat> Matt there's a movement, and I follow a lot on social media, there's a movement that I, I tend to agree with, um, but it always comes down to well, where are you gonna find the money? Pay people to stay home so that you don't have these restaurant workers or owners that are crushed under the financial burden. Pay people to stay home so that they are not worried about where the paycheck is gonna be coming from. Do you support that movement or is that something that again comes down to the devil is in the details? Yeah, Joe, doesn't this entire year just feel like Groundhog Day, uh, where it's like we, we have to keep having the conversation. We've had this conversation before, and it is a conversation that needs to keep happening. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, you look at Canada, who offer, I forget how much they gave, but they gave every resident like $1,000 a month to stay home. And the United States gave $1,400 once to, the, every, to people who needed it. Uh, the, I do feel like the, one of the solutions would be to pay people to stay home, and that would involve trickle-up economics. And we've talked about this in comparison to the 2008 financial crash, when they bailed out the banks, but then the banks still took everybody's homes. When if they bailed out the homeowner, the homeowner would have paid the mortgage and it would have went back to the bank. I feel it's the same way here. It's like if you bail out the individual, if you bail out the small business, that money will trickle back up because those people will be able to pay their rent. They'll be able to pay their mortgage. They'll be able to, uh, the, the, there's a lot they could do. Um, and I do think that's, that's a very important aspect is not, if you're going to tell people they can't open their business or they can't go to work, then we should have some sort of compensation for that. And I do believe in the end, it would actually prove financially beneficial to the country. And it's not like we don't have a model for that, Matt. I, I, I want to move on to a couple of other things. But, you know, I was thinking the other day, the federal government pays farmers not to do something. Yeah. Why would we not follow that model? We don't want people socializing and mingling. Yeah. Let's pay people for their good behavior. I guess, I'm, you know, carrot and the stick, right? 
Well, um, funny that mo most farms are in red states and government subsidies are gratefully accepted there. But uh, when it comes to the nation as a whole, uh, we have this no government assistance concept going on. There's a film clip I'm going to say for when you run for governor. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to use that one, Matt. I mean, it's the truth. It's like everybody believes in a bailout until it's somebody else. And we're all in this together right now. So I think the whole nation could use a bailout. And again, I, I, it, it sounds expensive, but ultimately that money is circulated back into the economy and, and people profit off of it. I, I agree, I agree. Matt, you have a city council meeting tomorrow night. Anything you wanna highlight and what's coming up? Yeah, well, the uh, big news is last night in our land use committee or two nights ago, was it last night? Jeez, Groundhog Day again. Um, Last night in our land use committee, uh, we unanimously approved the uh, affordable housing overlay. And I expect that to go towards the board for a full vote on Thursday and hopefully be approved. And again, as we discussed last week is this will expand opportunities to build affordable housing in Somerville without having to worry about onerous lawsuits or uh, obstacles put up in the way uh, and allow more density for affordable housing. So I'm very excited about that. And uh, other cities like Boston are now looking at that as well. So once again, Somerville is uh, leading the way on a lot of issues and influencing the, the community as a whole. I'm also hoping that we're gonna be passing a racial profiling ban uh, for police interactions with civilians. And that will probably not be tomorrow night, but we will have a special meeting on uh, the week after that to close out the year, uh, approve some COVID-19 funds and I think that we'll be approving that that night as well. Okay, and there's a couple of highly specialized uh, community meetings coming up. I see where um, Councilor Davis and Councilor Ballantyne are hosting something on some infrastructure changes going on around the Davis Square, Holland Street, College Ave area. Yes, God bless their hearts. Uh, I say that every time traffic and parking comes into my- Oh yeah, you, you would think, you know, traffic and parking is as volatile as any, uh, as any big picture issue in America. It still is, and I feel as though it always will be. As long as we are an automobile driven society, it's gonna be an issue. Yep. Matt, I wanted to go right into, um, I'm sorry, on your council update. You, you good? All set? Oh, yes. Okay, so I wanna go into um, a meeting, many meetings that have been happening in terms of the school reopening plan. And to set the stage, you are um, an official member of the Somerville School Committee in your role as president of the city council. So if you could just give us a brief update on what's happened, um, expectations were that the school system would try a reopening plan in early December, that was scrapped. You're now into um, planning for another um, type of plan for the first quarter of 21. You wanna take it from there? Yeah, so uh, I was announced on Monday night uh, by the mayor's office that uh, our previous plan, for, our, our plan was to open in December and then it was to open in January. And now because of the lack of uh, HVAC equipment and the demand all over the place for this, uh, they, they, the mayor's office announced that the schools won't be open until March at the earliest. Uh, so this was kind of a major hit for a lot of people who wanna see the schools reopen uh, and it, it was very, it was difficult to hear. I do believe that the safety is the most important aspect. I was a little concerned to learn that we might be considering opening youth athletics before we open the schools, which I think is a contradiction of a very hard stance that I've supported thus far. So I know a lot of people are going to be very disappointed to hear this, but uh, the schools apparently won't be open until at least March. Matt, I just want to make sure, you know, for folks who aren't regular viewers of our show um, or don't get into the details, um, I want to make sure they understand what's what's taking place. It's not a case of where um, this, the mayor does not want kids to go back to school or the system doesn't want kids to go back to school. What they are trying to do is to make the buildings that the kids are going to go back as safe as possible. And that's where the HVAC systems come into play. As many people know, some of our school buildings are ancient. Ancient meaning they're over 30 years old, 40 years old. 
they do not have adequate ventilation systems based on what you know um, health folks are telling us and CDC is telling us, if you're gonna put that many kids back into a school, especially during the hot months or the cold months when you cannot have windows open, you need to have an up-to-date modern HVAC, HVAC system. Based on that, the city has been working on that and have now come into a quote unquote supply chain problem where a lot of schools across the country are trying to do the same things. They're trying to upgrade their older buildings to have safe and adequate ventilation systems. That causes a supply chain problem. Have I got that right? Yeah, that's right. And uh, I'd say that, you know, the city council approved funding for these HVAC systems. That was a unanimous decision. And what I said then was, I think this would be a good investment, even if there wasn't a pandemic, uh, just because having quality air filtration systems, especially close to highways, is a really good thing. Um, I would say, you know, I, I wish, yeah, I'll leave it at that, that I do think the HVAC systems are important and necessary. I wish that we could think about some other alternatives for maybe getting, so some of the schools need HVAC systems more than others. And something like the Argenziano School and the Somerville High School, I believe, uh, are not, uh, they don't need HVAC st systems as much. And then one of the things we discussed at this meeting the other night when we talked about the potential of opening uh, hockey and basketball and swimming uh, for uh, school athletics, and it was argued that the gyms could handle uh, COVID because they have better ventilation, they have wider buildings. One of the things I said is, can we have the kids go to school there then? Uh, so I think we, we, we might have to get innovative. And if we do have buildings that uh, can be responsibly used, I definitely think we should consider that. Are we talking about, I, I caught on one of the news reports, granted in a different part of the country where the weather might be warmer, are we talking about utilizing outdoor spaces come yeah, the later yeah. spring? Well, the, I, I believe in some capacity they are already utilizing outdoor spaces. Uh, I, or I forget if it was that they're planning to or they're thinking about it. Yeah, they, they have been considering utilizing outdoor spaces. That gets a little more difficult the colder it gets. So, and then there's a, a, there's a big debate, especially amongst uh, developmentally disabled students or students who need extra attention. That seems to be the big priority for the school committee and trying to find some solutions to at least get them to go to school uh, before we get the entire uh, school system back in order. You're talking higher, higher need students. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, it comes on the heels of all of the plans that uh, the state and city governments have been doing for the past um, seven months, eight months. In, in light of the fact that the federal government and the health officials are now touting a vaccine, is the city of Somerville working on a distribution plan for the vaccine should it become available? within the first quarter, second quarter of next year? I'm not aware of that, so I can't really answer that. But I hope, I just hope we all get the vaccine as soon as possible. I think a lot of people might have seen the news that the Trump administration uh, rejected doubling their vaccine supply. And now we may have to wait as late as June for the entire nation to get vaccinated. So I, I'm not aware of any plans right now for the vaccine, but we definitely, uh, I'm sure people are working on it and I'd be interested to learn more. Yeah, I think what we're gonna do, rather than put some of the elected on, on the spot, I am gonna be requesting um, that either the Director of Health and Human Services or somebody from the mayor's office begin that conversation because people are asking me, you know, I, 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 what do I know? But they're asking the question, if the vaccine becomes available in a widespread distribution plan in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, how does that trickle down to Somerville? How do we institute that? Who does it? I mean, we even have some states out there now, Matt, that they're talking about instituting the National Guard to vaccinate people as fast as we can once we get the supplies in. So it, it comes into a massive 
um, inoculation program like we've never seen in this country before. Um, I, I, you know, I'm wondering out loud because people are asking me and I'm asking you. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I hope it's handled better than the ventilators. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, Governor Baker did mention that he thinks this Commonwealth has enough P PPE and ventilators to handle the current surge that we're in. It's not like it's coming anymore. Yeah. It's here. We're in the middle of it. That's why we're setting up triage hospitals. That's why we're, you know, Baker is rolling back stuff. I, I, it astounds me, Matt, how many people I still observe on social media or out in the public who don't get it. They just don't understand what, what dire straits we are in if we don't get control of this thing. Yeah, well, the, unfortunately, there's a lot of bad information out there. And unfortunately, uh, this pandemic has gotten politicized, uh, mostly on the right, but a little bit on the left as well. Uh, but something as simple as wearing a mask has become a political issue. And I've never felt like my freedoms have been restricted from wearing a mask. I feel like it's protecting myself and people around me. Uh, so something as simple as that. And again, I'll always continue to give the same advice, hoping that people if you forget, you know, wash your hands, keep six feet apart from people, stay away from large crowds, don't touch your face, and please wear a mask. And if everybody in the na if everyone in the nation wore a mask, there would be a dramatic decrease. Unfortunately, we live in a city and a state where a lot of people understand that, but there are other places and some people who don't understand that something as simple as wearing a mask can help you and help everyone around you. Well, I think based on what's coming out of the uh, president-elect's um, mouth and out of his press releases these days, those folks who still don't believe in it are in for a rude awakening when this guy takes office in January, because I have a feeling he's going to mandate it. He's going to mandate wearing a mask in public. You know, I, I, I would probably disagree with that I, in, the, in the sense that I don't think that will happen, because I, I've heard him say the opposite, that the states and Every, every region should be dealing with it differently. And it, it is a very difficult ground to mandate wearing a mask because then you have to enforce that mandate. And then that becomes a problem as well. And you have some people who just, you know, uh, somehow s are still unaware that they should be wearing a mask. And then there's people who blatantly refuse to do so. And that can cause altercations with authorities as well. So I really, it, it's a shame people just can't see this for what it is and just wear the mask voluntarily. It, Matt, you know, I'm considerably older than you, but I don't consider myself wiser than other people, but I had to look at it this way. You are mandated to wear a seatbelt while you're operating a vehicle. If you, you don't are, wear a seatbelt, you're taking your life into your hands. You are, but then a police officer pulls you over for not wearing that seatbelt and sometimes issues arise from things like that. So I'm not, I'm not arguing against having a mandate. I'm just saying that I'd be surprised if there was a, man, a national mandate from the president telling everybody to wear a mask. I, I, I'd be surprised if that happened. And yep. even in Massachusetts, where we're taking this very seriously, and Somerville, where we actually will issue tickets for people not wearing masks, that's not happening. People aren't getting ticketed. People aren't getting arrested or accosted by the police for not wearing masks. And, uh, you know, the, you can make an argument for that, but you can make arguments against it as well. No, I got it. I'm going to have you back in January. We're going to debate that one again after Biden <laughs> takes office. How's that? Well, yes, we'll see. All right. Um, Matt. It'll be, good. It'll be good to have someone who actually believes in science and believes in the role of the federal government, though. So that's nice. Amen, Counselor. Um, Let's talk a little bit about what you're planning and what we talked about for next week. Kind of like a year in review wrap up. You wanna try that for next week because I, I wanna make the announcement. I know we have uh, Facebook Live watchers who watch us when we do our shows. We're not gonna be back on the 23rd of December nor on the 30th of December. So next week will be uh, 2020 in review. You're welcome to bring as many of the counselors on as you'd like. Um, or we can do this solo, totally up to you. But I think, uh, you know, from a memorialization standpoint, it's good to have the city council president's perspective on what it's been like um, trying to 
run city government during a pandemic with the enormous financial, emotional, uh, psychological strains that have been uh, all of us have undertaken. And I think it's, you know, it's safe to say that we here in Somerville pride ourselves a lot on being innovative, for being inclusive, for being trendsetters, for being funky, for being all the things that we've come to know over the years. But we're also an extremely giving community. And it has been extraordinary for me to watch the amount of giving and the amount of innovative assistance that entities, individuals, and, and the city or have been giving to those less fortunate. People who are out of a job, people who may be hungry, people who may be getting evicted. I mean, I think it's worthy of boasting next week to talk about what we have done right in 2020. Yeah, I look forward to that because I feel like we've done a lot in the past year. Uh, we've done a lot to address the pandemic, but we've also kept the government functioning too. And I look around the Commonwealth and I'm pretty proud that I'd say some of it was in the top tier of city councils uh, who managed to operate efficiently. Like we went remote very quickly when other councils are actually still not operating remotely and still having debates about that. Uh, so we, we went remote quickly and I was concerned that we were going to lose a lot of time because of the pandemic on the many issues that we care about outside of COVID. And we've actually gotten a lot done this year. I look forward to next year as well. And I'll definitely uh, come with some highlights next week. That's great. And then one, one goal we're going to have for 2021, you, when you uh, uh, resume the gavel wielding over your, your colleagues, is we're going to get Bill White on camera during meetings and council sessions. How's that? Great Someone's going to have to update his laptop or something. But uh, <laughs> I, I will say there's been some pretty good benefits to the remote meetings. Uh, one of them is that you, we've actually seen a much higher attendance rate for community meetings and public comments. So well, maybe you should think about letting them come to the city council chambers when we all resume in person in their pajamas, because you know half of them aren't aren't putting a suit on. Matt <laughs> McLaughlin, I want to thank you. We look forward to next week when we'll do a 2020 in review with City Council President Matt McLaughlin. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, thanks, Joe. As always, please stay safe, wear a mask, stay home if you can. I'm Joe Lynch for the Somerville Media Center.